while some may be satisfied with off-the-rack solutions. We design every investment to custom fit each of our clients' financial goals. We bring decades of experience, personal attention, and tailored solutions. How does that suit you? Barnett & Company, investments hand-tailored for each client. As the first ever African-American woman to host a major national news and public affairs program, Gwen Eiffel has experienced her share of challenges. I don't go around with a chip on my shoulder, but I, I have an awareness. And I consider the awareness something that you can use to your advantage because being underestimated is a great thing because you can always exceed people's expectations that way. And so I just let them be the ones who are limited and I try to move around and past it. Find out how she deals with living in the public eye and becoming a role model. Tonight on The A-List, I sit down with PBS senior correspondent, Gwen Eiffel. Once again, live from Washington, Moderator Gwen Ifo. Good evening. We begin tonight with the dramatic events in Egypt and the ramifications they may have for U.S. policy in the region. Every Friday, as moderator and managing editor for Washington Week, Gwen Eiffel hosts an in depth roundtable discussion that takes a closer look at what's been happening in the world of politics. She is a senior correspondent for PBS NewsHour, a best selling author and a respected political analyst. Her reputation for astute journalism and dedication to maintaining objectivity has served her well over the course of her career. And as you will see, there are many facets to this political insider. Gwen, welcome to the A-List. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, Allison. So when did you know you wanted to be a journalist? Uh, kind of obnoxiously young. I wanted to be a journalist when I was maybe nine years old. I knew I liked to write. I knew I liked to tell stories. At the time, I thought I could make up things. But then in our house, we always got newspapers. We always were exposed to the news around us. Our parents always made the connection between what was happening in the world and what was happening in our lives. And so I liked the idea of being able to get a byline, get an actual name, my name in the newspaper. I like the idea of asking questions and making people answer me, because my parents would not. And I like the idea of just writing it all down and telling the story. So I always wanted to be a journalist. I didn't want to be a television journalist. In fact, I aggressively did not want to be on television. Why is that? It just seemed shallow, and, and I was right. <laughs> it, it, it seemed kind of shallow and unnecessary. I loved newspapers, still do. Love the smell of them, love the feel of them, love being able to write at some length. And so that's what I really wanted to do, and, and I, I lucked out. I got to do it right away. And what was your first job out of college? At the Boston Herald American, right after I got out of Simmons College, I had done an internship at the Herald the summer before, in which um, I got the job in an odd way. I actually was a good little doobie, and I was a gopher. I would carry things from one place to another. One day I came to work, and I found that someone had left a note at my workspace with a racial slur on it, which I won't repeat. And my response was to look at it and to think, I wonder who this is for. I was just so wide-eyed about the idea that someone would say this to someone else that it occurred to me belatedly, oh, this was for me. I showed it to my boss, who was horrified. He showed it to his boss, who was horrified. They all promised they would, this was a terrible thing. They didn't want to fire the guy who had done it, who was near to retirement. And they said, if you ever need a job, come back. And I thought, I'll never go back. These people are racist. I'll never work for them. Except that the next year, when my like 45th job rejection came in, I said, I know that job. It looks really good. So I did go and take the job at the newspaper. And it turned out that I learned an important lesson, which is you can, it, you can get in any way. But then once you get in, you still have to prove yourself. And that's what I set out to do. How much of a challenge was it for you as not just a woman, but African-American woman to make it as a journalist at that age? Well, you know, I think I was, it stood me in a good stead that I was so wide-eyed about it. Uh, the fact that I didn't know that that slur was intended for me tells you a little bit about the way I was raised. We weren't raised to have chips on our shoulder and immediately assume insult. On the other hand, we were also raised to be aware that it, there is insult in the world. But 
as a result, I, my first instinct when so, if someone counted me out or underestimated me was never to say, oh, they hate me because I'm a woman or they hate me because I, I was black. I just set out to prove to them they were wrong. For whatever their reason was for underestimating me, I had to prove they were wrong, which meant I worked harder and didn't spend a whole lot of time then or now thinking, why do they not like me? I would just make them like me or at least make them respect me. Do you think that mentality stemmed from the fact that your father was a minister? That's a big part of it. And another big part of it is that my parents were immigrants. My mother was born in Barbados, my father was born in Panama. And there's something about immigrants. They come to this country and they have already made this remarkable decision in their lives to uproot their families, bring them here in order to get a better life. It's a kind of a heroic thing when you think about it. And immigrants are tough on their kids. They're saying, doggone it, I brought you here and you're gonna excel. And as a result, all my brothers and sisters and I were told we were going to college. It was never an option. We were told we were, we were going to accomplish things. It was never an option. And that also gets you over a lot of humps. These values instilled by her parents aided Gwen in beginning her remarkable career in journalism. And it was her work for two of the most prestigious newspapers in the country, the Washington Post and the New York Times, that enabled her transition into television news. Taking a job as chief congressional correspondent with NBC, Gwen learned firsthand what it's like to move from behind the scenes into the watchful public eye. Tell me about the transition between being a writer and being on air. Hard. Uh, no one tells you that it's hard to talk on television and to worry that your hair is right and your makeup is right and that you're speaking complete sentences and that you're writing to match pictures instead of just writing the story. So the first time I, I went out to cover a story when I worked for NBC, I went out without a camera crew. I kind of forgot that I needed a camera crew with me to tell the story. I learned, I got over that fast, but there were a lot of adjustments I had to make. But I, Tim Russert, was a great friend and he's the one who talked me into leaving the New York Times to work for NBC News and he kind of dared me first I was like I don't want to do that I'm not interested in that Tim I'll come on meet the press I love that that's fun I don't want to do that he said oh coward you know he kind of dared me and and oh but but also he then made sure I succeeded he was the best kind of mentor he gave me a producer who knew what they were doing who had incredible patience with me matched me up with uh, camera crews who were like, that's all right, honey, do it again. They were very patient and, and, and wanted to teach me. And as a result, I got to the point where I learned more and more when people had faith in me. And when I came to the news hour, they said, oh, well, you'll fill in for Jim Lehrer sometime, you'll anchor. And I said, I, I don't want to anchor. I don't know how to anchor. They said, oh, no, no, yeah, you can do it. And when people say you can do something, it's amazing how you can rise to the occasion if you have if you're willing to work at your skills. So television was different because you had a bigger, bigger impact. And that was hard to resist. But it's been a different way of telling the story and, and still the journalism I wanted always to do. How much control do you have specifically over the content uh, between the news hour and Washington Week? The news hour, it's a little bit different because at the news hour, it's a very collaborative process. There are a lot of us. But in the end, once we have an assignment, we're pretty much on our own about how to do it and who the guests are and we have we have uh, staffs who figure out with huge rolodexes if we still have those things and, and who we can talk to and who are the best experts and what's the perfect mix and it's kind of a chemistry experiment every day how to put together a news hour conversation washington week's a little different because it's like a sandbox i get my sandbox with my friends and we toss things back and forth and we have and i bring the smartest people i know who've written the most interesting stories that week about the big issues and then we put together a little dinner party that everybody else out there gets to eavesdrop and listen in on so it's it's a different set of and i have to like you if you you don't come <laughs> i got to like you and so as a result it's people pick up on that at home they pick up that we like and respect each other and it's fun uh, I love the beginning of Washington Week when the announcer says, you know, reporting on history as it has it, as it happens. And um, <laughs> there's so much truth to that, yeah. not only because, I mean, clearly, as soon as you report on it, it is history because we have such a short memory. But the fact that um, you're making an indelible imprint on not only, you know, whatever the news is at the time, but on the impressions of the public. Uh, how important to you is that? 
that's always timely and also always, as we said before, impartial. It's really important. on Friday Because we're on Friday nights, we're the leading edge of the weekend. We're two days before the Sunday shows. We're at the end of a week. And, but, and, and often I find over the years, people bury stories on Friday hoping that it'll get lost. So we often find ourselves on Friday ripping the show up from what we thought we were gonna do Thursday because the president has decided to me, oh, I think I'll fire this guy on Friday afternoon. And they hope to sweep it under the rug. So we try to stay on top of things and current because we're, we have to bring added value. Many of our viewers are people who already know what the headlines are. They've been following the news. Maybe they've been watching the news hour. And so I've got to give them another reason to hang around for an extra half an hour on Friday night. And a lot, enough of them do. And that I know that there's a hunger for someone to say, well, what does it mean? I don't understand why that happened. Or put it in context. Or I really want to hear what one of our panelists is Martha Raddatz from ABC who goes abroad a lot and to the war zones. And I want to know what she saw. I mean, we want to bring something they wouldn't get someplace else. And, and that to me is why also it's important to be impartial because people have to trust that you're telling them that you're giving them the straight skinny and that you're not polluting it with opinion because there are lots of places to go if you want opinion. I mean, and it's imp you can't miss opinion if you turn on your television anymore. You, can, you, you know, you just can't. But on our program, we're thinking, you know what, figure it out for yourself. We're gonna tell you why this happened. We're gonna explain what's happening behind the scenes, what we heard, what's in the back of our notebooks that we didn't get to report otherwise. But then you make sense of that, figure out what that means. I think we betray trust if we start to tell them what we think. It is this unwavering dedication to maintaining impartiality, as well as her reputation for keen political analysis that has enabled Gwen Eiffel to bring so much to Washington Week. Since taking the job in 1999, she has helped to greatly broaden the viewership for the show by reaching out to younger demographics. And in 2004, Gwen's skill at moderating the complex issues and personalities on Washington Week facilitated a new and exciting opportunity. What was your first reaction when you were asked to moderate that debate in 2004 between Cheney and Edwards? I was thrilled. I had never done anything of that. I moderated debates before, but nothing on that scale. Um, Jim Lehrer, my boss, had done several of them. And I said, the first thing I did was go to him and say, ah, what should I do? And his response to me was, well, you just keep all your questions to yourself and focus. And I thought, uh-oh. because And he made a good point, which is that all the campaigns have people whose full-time job it is to figure out what is it that you're going to ask the candidate. And your job is to make sure they don't know. And the best way to do that is to be as discreet as possible about your research, about how you're preparing, about the order of the questions. And you have to worry about the timing and that, that it's fair, there's an equivalent number. On some level, both campaigns have said it's okay. They've, 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 bought, they've uh, approved your presence there, which means that he, Either they hate you equally or they like you equally. But either way, you have to be very, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm carrying questions for millions of people who don't get a chance to ask them. And that the subject matter, especially for a vice presidential debate, is often foreign policy and domestic policy because there's only one debate. And so you have to squeeze a lot in there and being driven by the notion that you're telling people who this person is and whether they should be a heartbeat away from the presidency. It's not an inconsequential decision. So it, it's, it's a little daunting, but um, worth it. It was the hardest, most exciting thing I've ever done. How different is it preparing for a moderator role and being a journalist? It's the same set of skills. You ha the only thing is that you're confined by time constraints. I mean, the set of skills are asking questions, listening for answers. The listening is the hard part, by the way, because sometimes you don't want someone to say, and then I killed my wife, and you go, okay, next. You want to have heard that, you <laughs> right. know? And so you want to do that, and, you wanna all, and you're also very conscious of the fact that you're not sitting on the front row of history just because you're a nice person. You're sitting there because you represent someone and you're carrying questions for other people too. That's all journalism to me. Um, the performance part, which comes from being on television, is helpful because you want to go for clarity. But beyond that, I don't really worry so much about that as I do about, am I asking the right questions and am I making a reasonable effort short of chasing them around the table, which I will not do, to get a clear answer. 
Has there ever been a time where you've been asked to either cover a story or to moderate something and you had to turn it down because you didn't think you could apply that sort of impartiality to it? No, no. I've turned down things mostly because of scheduling questions or because it's uh, the, the event itself seemed partisan to me and I didn't want to be involved in an event sponsored, for instance, just for the Democratic Party or just by the Republican Party. I'm very conscious of the fact that we have to maintain our down the middleness and it's not because I myself have a point of view that I want, that I can't, that I feel like I have to tamp down. It's mostly I want, I'm conscious of perceptions. And I, so I stay down the middle as much as possible. Well, since you mentioned perceptions, <laughs> what about the fact that your book was coming out mm -hmm. um, just a few months after the vice presidential debate yeah. in 2008 and the criticism you got related to that? Well, that was, that was an interesting um, test because I was in that zone I was describing where you're just focused on the debate and what questions you're going to ask. Um, I, I, two days before the debate, I fell down at home, broke my ankle, and was about to have, was going to have, have surgery after the debate was over. So I went to St. Louis on crutches and in a wheelchair, which was really fun, and on pain medication, which I could not take during the debate in case anyone accused me of being on drugs. So there were a little bit of pressures. And then in the middle of this all, um, a book I had been writing, which was in plain sight, I'd written about it in Newsweek, I mean in Time Magazine actually, it had been published, it had been publicized for some months, but people who were trying to taint my impartiality grabbed a hold of this and said, aha, she's writing a book about Barack Obama. Well, I wasn't writing a book about Barack Obama, I was writing a book about breakthrough candidates, of which Barack Obama was one of them, um, this, this generation of young black elected officials who had decided to take up the cudgel their parents had left when they had marched in civil rights marches, opened these doors, and now there was this generation of people walking through. And I'd identified four key characters, one of which was Obama, but a lot of others as well who I'd traveled the country and met and wanted to write the story about public service. So this is the book I'm writing. I knew, I consciously did not write the Barack Obama chapter because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know who was going to win the election, and frankly, I was one of the last people who thought Barack Obama was going to win. I honestly didn't think we were ready for it yet. So, but because I didn't know the outcomes, I didn't want to write the chapter. I just, I purposely, in my own mind, kept arm's length. So I was being attacked for something I had gone out of my way not to do. And the, the, I was vindicated in the end, because when the book came out, all my critics fell silent, because they realized it was what I said it was. Her book, the Breakthrough, Politics and Race in the Age of Obama became a national bestseller. And with its success, Gwen received praise for her in-depth look at the landscape of contemporary American politics in light of President Obama's history-making victory. With such a long list of accomplishments, she has become a role model to a new generation of young, aspiring professionals. But for Gwen, as with the President, there is always one word that seems to enter the equation. When do you think, if ever, that race won't be an issue? When we'll no longer say, this was the first African American to do X, this was the first African American yeah. to be this. When will, will we move past that? Part of me would like for us to get past it like tomorrow. Right. Part of me thinks it won't happen in our lifetimes. And part of me doesn't know if it's necessary. I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea to, to notice or take note of race. I just don't think it should be something that holds people back. So if you look at me and you say to me, I, don't, I didn't notice you were black, I would just think you were blind. I would think, well, what, what's wrong? Why wouldn't I, you notice that I was black? What I want you to notice is that I'm black, but it's not important in a negative way. Because race can be a positive, I consider it to be. And most people I know, most African Americans I know, consider their race to be a positive, something that adds to their life. To say that you, to ignore it is to assume that there's something negative about it. Because if you thought it was a good thing, you would want to notice it. So part of me thinks this whole idea of a culture where we're race blind is overstated. Yet it would be nice to stop having firsts. It would be nice not to be, I, I would be thrilled if I was not the only African American woman hosting a national news and public affairs show. Thrilled. But we're not there yet. And the next time someone else gets a job like this, it'll be another breakthrough. The next time a woman runs and actually gets elected president, it'll be another breakthrough. We're going to live through firsts for a while yet. So what's the key? What, what do you think the most important message to teach this next generation of, of adolescents and children is to hopefully not make them colorblind, but make them color friendly? 
you know, I think they're doing it without us. Mm -hmm. I, I, I talked to, I have a godson who's 14 years old, and I, I remember when Barack Obama was elected, I said, look, a black president, and he looked at me and went, uh-huh, so yeah, can I go play now? I play with his Asian friends and his Latino friends and his white friends. In some ways, we are, in our generation, kind of more obsessed about it because we kind of lived through a time in which it was confining. We're raising, in many cases, children who are not as confined by it, and that's excellent. At some point, they may realize there's a negative or there's a conflict or there's friction, but by and large, we're raising a generation who are better at it than we were, and that, that gives me great hope. How serious do you take the responsibility to share that um, ideal and kind of that message with the next generation, and specifically that generation of, of young, black, aspiring professionals? It's huge, it's huge, and uh, I don't know how I could, I don't know how anybody could want to walk away from that. I mean, there's some athletes who say, I'm not a role model, and more power to them, they're maybe richer than I am and can afford not to be. But I was raised differently. I was raised that everything you do has an impact, and it, and it ought to have a positive impact if you can control that. And I can't look into the eyes of a young black girl who, but for one little option in their, her life, could have a great, great life, a great, fulfilled life, and one little limitation couldn't. Uh, maybe she didn't get to go to preschool because her mother couldn't afford it. Maybe she is the child of a single mother. Maybe she's not. Maybe she's smart as a whip, but just can't apply herself. How do I know that her just seeing me doing it might not be the thing that changes her, that puts her on the right path, that inspires her? That's not really very hard for me to do, just to be an example, and then take the next step and, and apply that example to the individual young people I know in my life who I make sure I have high expectations of as well. The example that Gwen Eiffel has set has been remarkable. Pushing through barriers of gender and race throughout her career, the success that she has achieved is no small feat. Washington Week remains the longest running news and public affairs program on television. And with such a revered voice at the helm, speaking out for the value of public broadcasting, there is no doubt that Gwen Eiffel will continue reporting history as it happens and asking the questions that matter. I read that in the 40 plus year history of Washington Week, there was only one time where the show was threatened to even not exist. Mm -hmm. And that might be carrying it a little too far. I think during the Nixon administration yeah. in 1972. And what saved it was the audience um, and how many letters they got of support. True. How important do you take that into consideration? How important is your audience? And and then, you know, in supporting, yeah. especially a PBS station and a PBS um, program. It, in the days, we mean when people wrote letters? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We, would, we still get letters, but very occasionally, mostly emails. They're incredibly important because if they don't speak when they feel that something of value is threatened, then we operate in a void. If I, other, without an audience that is engaged, I'm just talking to a camera, which is a piece of equipment. If I'm talking through that camera into someone who's sitting at their home who's saying, hey Gwen, tell me what you, what, what's going on. I want them also to feel that I've made an investment in them and that they've made an investment in me. At times like this, when Congress is having one of their periodic debates about public media and whether we should exist, it's kind of important to hear from the viewers and to hear from someone who says, for instance, I'm in Chattanooga. I think public television is great because I like Big Bird, but I also think it's great because I like the fact that, that my local station covers my community. It's not just about the news hour or Washington Week. It's about what local stations do and what they bring, and which nobody else brings, by the way. It's pretty unique. And even on a national level, Washington Week, when it started, was the only thing of its kind, a reporter's roundtable. Then a million other shows followed. Then it morphed into an opinion, sh an opinion shop where everybody had opinions. And now we've come full circle where Washington Week, once again, is one of the only things of its type that exists. That means I think there is a niche for it, and I, we need to hear that as much as possible from our folks. What's been the biggest challenge of your job? <sighs> the biggest challenge of my job is saying no to things. I want to do everything, and people want me to do everything. <laughs> It's, kind of, it's a girl challenge, because we always say, okay, let's, uh, I'll be there. And then you think, what was I thinking? On the other hand, I don't want to say no to the thing that might just bring me some added value. And so I'm always 
trying to stretch myself a little too thin. Um, but I have come to realize, probably just in the last few years as I thought about it, how valuable what I do for a living is and that the grass is green under my feet and not someplace else. And so I try to focus as much as possible on the things that I do that I love as opposed to the things that I do that I make me crazy that I shouldn't do, the stress, the overstress, stretching myself too thin stuff. Because I get to do, I still get to do what I got into this business to do, which is to sit on the front row and ask questions and demand answers. For a copy of this program, call 423-702-7800 or email at videoservices at wtcitv.org. When ordering, please include the program title, date, and time of broadcast. While some may be satisfied with off-the-rack solutions, we design every investment to custom fit each of our clients' financial goals. We bring decades of experience, personal attention, and tailored solutions. How does that suit you? Barnett & Company. Investments hand-tailored for each client.